Okay. Next speaker, Yosh Riyadi. Um, you're, what kind of name is that? Indonesian? It's Indonesian. Indonesian. Yep. Michael, I think, was Vietnamese, I think. But anyway, it's great to have people from the whole region. And I like Yosh a lot because he's a serverless fanboy, uh, like myself. I think you're even running a serverless user group, right? As of sorts. Yes. Who's into serverless? Woo okay, great. Nice. Nice one. Are you, were you joking? No. <laughs> Just another people's server. Uh, ah. <laughs> no, I, I genuinely think service is amazing. Um, and it'd be great to, I, I can't remember who, who put your hand up. We, we should talk, um, but um, Yoss is definitely leading the, the charge with uh, server stuff. And the step functions is definitely very interesting. So you got 15 minutes. All right, thank you. Uh, evening, everyone. So today I'd like to share with you uh, Sagas with step functions. So we've moved on from monoliths to microservices, right? And in this new world, there's no single source of truth anymore. Um, all, each service has its own data store and to uh, process a single business action involves communicating with multiple discrete services all over your infrastructure. So let's imagine we're building a travel booking platform. Um, we have a travel agent service, which coordinates the process of booking a trip. And behind the scenes, this service might communicate with different services. Like, for example, um, we have a car service that we rent a car from, a hotel service where we book a hotel, and an airline service where we book a flight. And each of those services, each of those service calls, Combined together, in, combined together into a single business process known as booking a trip. And so, but it's not so simple. Um, let's imagine that two of our calls were completed successfully. The car was uh, booked, the hotel was booked successfully, but the airline service didn't complete the uh, flight booking. So how should we handle cases like this? So normally, we would have application-level mechanisms that enforce some invariant within all our services. For example, if the flight uh, booking fails, perhaps the car rental service does some logic to um, unbook the car, uh, the car booking. Or this logic could live in the travel agent service or somewhere else within our application. Um, but this is fine for four services, but how about 500 services? Uh, with all these concurrency, mechanis uh, concurrency control mechanisms living across all different services all over the place, it can become seriously unmanageable. So that's where Sagas come in. So Sagas is a, well, was first described in a 1987 paper. Um, it was meant to be a solution for an alternative to long-lived database transactions. And recently, this pattern has been applied to distributed systems. So uh, most of the uh, distributed saga, the first half of this talk is mostly from this particular paper. Uh, the link is available in the slides, uh, which I will share later. And so to summarize, a saga is, represents a single business process. So within the saga, there could be many service calls. The distributed saga is a collection of requests. Each request could be uh, a single call to, uh, to another microservice. So book hotel is a request, and book flight is a request. And each request has a compensating request that's executed on failure of a request. So we have cancel hotel, which compensates for book hotel. We have cancel flight, which compensates for book flight. So what a compensating request does is it semantically undoes a request. So it basically tries to roll back and revert to the original state of equilibrium before the request. Now, some things you can't undo. For example, you send an email. There's no way to unsend the email. But what you can do is send another email to say that, please disregard that email. So essentially, compensating request tries to restore your application state to a state of equilibrium, the original state before the requests. And so for the distributed saga to work, the both requests and compensating requests needs a few uh, attributes for it to work. So I'm just going to quickly go through some of these so that uh, we are on the same page. So requests 
and compensating requests must be idempotent. So when you apply it once, so, uh, so idempotent means that uh, if you apply it once, and you apply it twice, or how many times, the result will be the same. So, and this is because we may receive the same message more than once. What if, for example, our first request to the book, uh, to the car service, times up? We don't know what happened, we've waited for too long, so we have to send another request to the uh, car service, and the second request is successful. But what if it turns out that the first request arrives after the sec second request? So we have to handle that case by making our request idempotent. So the second key thing is that both requests and compensating requests must be commutative, meaning regardless of the order at which they arrive, they have to uh, arrive at the same result. So even if, a can uh, even if the cancel car request comes first, and then another book car, a book car request arrives later, it should still result in a cancelled car booking. So this is because messages can arrive in any order. So these two are the requirements of uh, Saga requests. So if you have those uh, attributes, a distributed Saga guarantees that all requests in the Saga are so either successfully completed, or you have a subset of requests and their compensating requests are executed. So if you look at this diagram here, in this case, we have the first two steps uh, were completed successfully, but the third failed. So in this case, the compensating request for the failed request is executed, as well as all the previous requests. So the point of having a distributed saga is to ensure consistency and correctness across all your microservices, because all the state is spread out all over your application we need a way to sort of keep everything consistent and correct. And that's, that's what a saga is, basically. It's a failure pattern to manage, to handle failures within your microservices. So how do you define a, a distributed saga? You could define it as a state machine, basically. So this is an example for our, so on the left is an example for our example. Um, uh, we, we'll look at it in more detail next. So. So who executes, who, who manages these sagas? Uh, you need an, something called an, a, a saga execution coordinator, which is essentially a service, uh, a standalone service, that stores and interprets your saga's uh, state machines. It's responsible for executing each step in your state machines. So this service is what actually talks to your microservices. Also handles failure recovery by executing any compensating requests, should there be any failure. So the benefit of using distributed sagas is instead of having all that concurrency control mechanisms all over your application in your individual microservices, you can isolate all this logic in a single place, which is your saga execution coordinator. And creating a new workflow is just creating a new state machine. You don't need to create a whole new service to support a new business process. So, but some of you might be thinking, wow, building this Saga execution coordinator sounds really difficult and time consuming. That's where AWS Step Functions come in. So AWS Step Functions, I think of it as basically a Saga execution coordinator as a service. Not official, it's not officially called this, but this is how I think of it. It supports uh, a push model using Lambda and a pull model using applications hosted on EC2 and ECS. It's fully managed as retries are handling, and it costs reasonable, I think. So the way step functions work is you define state machines in JSON using its, uh, something called an AWS states language. It's AWS own like, language for defining state machines. You can then visualize your state, ma state machines in the AWS console, and you can execute and monitor view logs from executions from the console as well. We also, we'll, we'll see this in a demo soon. So this is an example of a state machine written in the AWS states language. So it's just JSON. So to produce the state machine on the right, we have this JSON where it says we start at uh, a state called hello world. Then we define a series of states. So hello world is one of them. Um, so this, is, this points to a Lambda function. And we, we tell set function that this is also our end state. And this, uh, JSON produces this state machine. 
Um, there are many different uh, types of nodes that you can use to define your state machines. So task is the basic one. So uh, uh, compensating requests and requests like book hotel, cancel hotel is a task. And the other state types are more for flow control. So the choice state type lets you perform if conditionals. If um, the outcome of the previous task is A, you can call this task. Otherwise, call this other task. Parallel lets you execute tasks in parallel. And you have many other building blocks that you can use to build your state machines. So here's an example of uh, modeling a task as a, a business process as a state machine. So uh, set, let's say we're trying to uh, do, given an image, you want to analyze the image and create a thumbnail of it. So we can define that process as a state machine. So in this case, we start, we form a task that, uh, oops, form a task that extracts the image meta metadata. We use a choice uh, node to perform conditionals. Then we have a parallel execution. And yeah, this is an example. We'll have a hands-on soon. So other things you can do in your state machines is configure retries. So for example, let's say our, a, a request to the, booking, uh, to the car service times out. Then we want to retry it. And we, so we can configure, you can tell step functions to retry certain steps. So in this case, we retry if there's a specific class of error that's returned by the previous task. Uh, we retry after, um, how long after the previous um, failure do we retry, how many attempts, and if we want to use exponential backoff. Uh, we can also catch errors uh, in our state machine. And we can map different errors to different steps. So this is just a screenshot of the console. So let's just look at the uh, AWS step functions. So four minutes. Okay, so you remember this uh, diagram? So basically, we're trying to build a state machine, a saga for this. Um, so I already have it. So basically, this is uh, what my state, my saga looks like. Uh, it's really just using JSON, and uh, so we, we can. Want that JSON. Unfortunately, yes. I'm waiting for. I think AWS should really create a GUI to like drag and drop, like Cloudcraft, where you can just drag and drop, but you have to write it by hand for now, I hope. So let's try executing this uh, state machine. So I have a, oops. So basically, this is the request that the uh, trip service would be uh, sending to our uh, travel booking platform. So here we're executing. So we start by executing all three uh, requests to the different services in parallel. Then, so it just uh, completed. So it's successful. So it went to this uh, state uh, step, a state. Yep. And using this console, you can sort of see um, the inputs and outputs at each step. And any exceptions? So I think so. This is the uh, happy path. So let's look at the uh, not so happy path. So in this case, I've basically just created a, a flag to make it fail. So in this case, okay, already failed. Wow, so it's so fast. Okay, so uh, we've executed. Oh no, it's in progress. Sorry. So. Uh, we've executed the uh, three requests in parallel, but the flight booking actually failed. And as, because of that, we go through this particular path in our state machine. Uh, how do you know the flight one failed today? So the annoying, the annoying thing about uh, the parallel node is that if one of them failed, all of them failed. All of them fails. You can't tell which one. You can't tell which one in this case. Uh, yep. So, but anyway, if you execute things in parallel and you you want you want all of them to succeed, no, no, wait, sorry. Uh, I mean, in this case, we have to cancel all of them, even if one failed, because the others might be in flight and arrive later. 
So anyway, in this case, uh, we go to this uh, path in the state machine. We call our compensating requests and complete the uh, request. Yep. And so from this console, you can also see like um, a log of all the executions. So it's pretty helpful. And yep, it's really cool. So in this case, you can get. Um, so what I did is. Uh, wait. Yeah, you, ca you can't actually tell, so <laughs> it sucks. All right, so we've seen, uh, so we've learned about uh, distributed sagas. It's a pattern for handling failure in microservices. Uh, we learned about the role of the saga execution coordinator. We looked at step functions and how we can use it to, for sagas. We had a brief look at the states language and the console. Um, that's all I have to share for today. Thank you. Yeah. How do you ensure? No, you, ha you have to write your requests. So the book flight, you have to write your book uh, requests, like the book, book uh, steps, and your compensating requests to be commutative. It's not step function's responsibility to be commutative. OK, so you have to design that exactly. first yep. before you can apply step. Yep, exactly. For basically, your requests and your compensating requests have to be This has to be item potent, yep. This is just part of the requirements of a distributed saga. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just like you mentioned that we had to know which, which step exactly in exact that failed that yep. causes, right? So can the compensating step be just trying to talk or something? Then from that way we can actually know which Okay. So yeah, yeah. So, so I mentioned that the annoying thing with uh, the parallel task is you really can't know which one failed. And so the only, so I actually tried uh, a few different approaches. Uh, not this one, sorry. So this is another version <laughs> where basically I tried to find which step actually failed. Uh, and this works, but is not as elegant <laughs> as the other design. Um, because anyway, if one of them, one of the requests fail, we have to, and we execute the request in parallel, we have to uh, cancel all of them. So, the other approach is to have them execute sequentially. So in this case, so in this case, we know exactly where uh, which um, requests fail. So for example, if we execute at the book hotel and this failed, we immediately only cancel the hotel uh, request. And if we go to the book flight, we immediately cancel the flight and the hotel. So this is another approach. But when you execute in parallel, you have to cancel all of them. You have to compensate all the requests. Yeah. Yes. Is there any guarantee from Amazon that what happens if step functions itself fail? Uh, yes. Uh, so you can actually um, sample. So there's some built-in, so you can catch uh, failures that are built-in and your own errors. And one of the built-in errors is actual step function fail to execute errors. So you can handle that. But in terms of guarantees, I mean, I'm not, I don't know what, yeah. I'm pretty sure it's guaranteed. <laughs> 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 Any more questions? I, I have a 
Is it possible to implement the PD, PDD or PDD into your Saga app? You need to test your Ah, you want to? Ah, I see, see. Ah, that's an interesting question. If your app I go much Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't think the tooling is there yet. I think, I guess one way you can do it is, so the way I created my, my uh, sagas is basically using this console. <laughs> so you just write my uh, state machines and just walk, work through them using like all possible inputs. But in terms of automating testing of your state machines, I think the tooling is not yet there. Yeah, really good, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's done. So for example in serverless you have to sort of run it would be to run integration tests in serverless, you kind of need the infrastructure live. But there but at the same time, there have been projects that lets you emulate parts of AWS infrastructure locally, like DynamoDB locally. So, but I don't think there's a st local step functions you can run at the moment, uh, which I think would, would uh, let you like, test it locally. But right now, the tooling is not yet available. All right, I think that's really interesting. I, I think I personally use like promise, promises to do most of that sort of um, grouping or whatever it's called. Um, but that looks more explicit and, and more helpful for uh, business people, I guess, and, and, and their team members, really, other than like looking at, because promises, as, as, I mean, promises are quite difficult to read, actually. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, would you would would you implement? Have you implemented this state machine in code before? Or? Uh, I think it's a pain in the ass. It's a pain. Yeah. It's a pain. So it's good when it's all like explicit, I guess. Yeah. Cool. Thanks again, Jos.